When Netflix came out with the earnings about three months ago, the stock absolutely popped. So will the same thing happen this quarter? Well, the company reported earnings last night, and let's spend the next 10 minutes trying to figure that out. My name is Brian Stoffel, and as of the time of this recording, I do not own shares of Netflix. I want to give a shout out to the sponsor for today's video, which is Y Charts. More from them in just a minute. <clears throat> so we are talking about Netflix's first quarter of 2023, and it has a market cap of just under $150 billion. Now, on the top line, revenue grew 4%. That's pretty anemic, and it did indeed miss both Wall Street's estimates, and it fell about $10 million short of management's own guidance. That's not a huge miss, but a miss nonetheless. On the bottom line, earnings per share on a gap basis came in at $2.88. That was less than last year. However, that actually beat Wall Street's and management's estimates. So a miss on the top, a beat on the bottom. But here's the big news. This is all anyone really focuses on with Netflix. They guided for quote unquote, modest positive paid net ads. Um, and they got that. They added one point, about 1.8 million subscribers during the quarter. Where did they come from? Not many came from the United States and Canada. Mm, decent amount from Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Latin America, they actually lost about half a million subscribers. More on that in just a minute. And in the Asia Pacific region, they gained about one and a half million subscribers. Um, the company said that overall in the United States and Canada, the revenue grew 8%, and that was mostly driven by price increases. In Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, revenue was down. Um, that was because of a decline in average revenue per member. However, part of that was foreign currency, um, but a 4% increase in paid memberships. Latin America, this is the big one we talked about. Revenue increased because of an increase in average revenue per member, but paid membership dipped, which they'll discuss. A lot of that had to do with, they thought, a big, bigger fourth quarter than expected, but also the crackdown on paid sharing. They were testing it out starting in Latin America, and they believe that had a role as well. And then in Asia Pacific, paid memberships were up 17%, um, and that was offset by a decrease in the average revenue per membership. One thing to remember here is that these are countries where they have lower price points and they're testing out different price points to see how they work. So it's not terribly surprising to see a big downswing in the average monthly revenue per member. Um, if we look at margins, gross margins dipped slightly, operating margins dipped a little bit more, net margin dipped a ton. This is more of a wonky foreign currency thing, um, but overall margins, they're stable. No one likes to see them heading down. But look at this on the on on free cash flow. Free cash flow um, almost tripled to over two billion dollars. While net income fell a little bit, free cash flow going up by that much for a company like Netflix is a big deal. The company is comfortable with this balance sheet. It's not wonderful, but it is the way that business is done uh, in the streaming business. Now, on that free cash flow, the company said that assuming no material swings in foreign currency, they now expect at least $3.5 billion in free cash flow this year, up from their prior expectation of $3 billion. So how did they do that? Well, let's look at the cash flow statement. Because you see, for net income in the year ago quarter, they had more net income than they did during this quarter. So how did they arrive at this? Well, you can look at each little line item, but this is the lion's share right here. A year ago, they spent about $3.6 billion on additions to content assets. What does that mean? That simply means that the company was spending more on paying for shows that are gonna be released in the next couple of quarters. So by spending about a billion dollars less on content to be released, they're spending less on shows that are going to be released in 2024 and 2025. Whether or not you think this is sustainable is a huge question that I will get to at the end. But if we go all the way to the bottom line, what we see is that the cash provided by operating activities jumped by about $1.2 billion. And as you can see, nearly all of that is accounted for in less spending on new content assets, paying actors, paying people to produce movies, post-production, things like that. Now, the company did say in terms of its advertising tier, engagement on that advertising tier is doing better than expected. And now the ad supported plan has on average 95% content parity globally with their ad free plans. 
They're also they also announced that they'll be uh, launching a private programmatic advertising marketplace and they will be using integral ad science and double verify to help advertisers know that they're getting what they pay for. Now, in the US, the ad plan is doing so well that they said that the total average revenue per membership subscription plus ads is greater than the standard plan and because it is doing so well they're upgrading the features for the ad plan in other words the resolution on your screen is going to improve from 720 to 1080. now um, this is pretty important because it's going to get to why the company's forecast was not as good as many were hoping for they said we're pleased with the most recent launches of paid sharing, and while we could have launched globally, broadly in the first quarter, we found opportunities to improve the experience for members. We learn more with each rollout, and we've incorporated the latest earnings. Now, let's just parse that corporate speak. It really means that this is something new that we're trying, and so we decided to try it on a smaller group of people probably in smaller areas and countries, Latin America is one of them, and they made a lot of mistakes and they're learning from those mistakes. Overall, that is probably a pretty wise way of going about it, but to me, that's what all of that means. Now, they said that they're gonna be implementing these changes and because of it, they're shifting out the timing from late qu first quarter to second quarter. So what that means is, is that s the membership growth that they were expecting is gonna be pushed further down the road and that's why the the company's forecast will be less than some were hoping for they said in the end what it translates into is in the second quarter new subscribers to netflix are going to be roughly similar to this quarter that they just reported in other words somewhere between one and two million ads now here's the guidance this is why the stock went down following their release they're calling for three percent top line growth Wall Street was expecting for about double that of 6%. On the bottom line, it's again, not as good as what Wall Street was expecting. There's no full year guidance. Wall Street's hoping for 9% growth on the top line, 15% on the bottom line. So what are we gonna watch moving forward? Well, as always, we're gonna keep our eye on subscribers. We're gonna keep an eye on that free cash flow number. Hitting $3.5 billion is a big deal. We're gonna watch and see how advertising is going. It seems like it's going better than expected, but they clearly did run into some hiccups when it comes to paid sharing. Overall, we think that the moat direction here is stable. We are cautiously optimistic about Netflix, um, but let's talk about the company's valuation. And for that, we're gonna to go to Y charts. We gotta think about how is Netflix's income statement optimized? And we believe it is optimized all the way up and down. So what stage of growth are they in? We believe that there's somewhere between stage four here, which is operating leverage, and stage five, which is the capital return. And you can see that in that area, it makes sense to look at things like the PE ratio, the forward PE ratio, the price to free cash flow, and a maybe reverse discounted cash flow, which we'll get to in a second. Now, again, thanks to Y Charts for sponsoring the video. And we head on over to Y Charts and we see that if we look at Netflix's PE ratio of about 33, that's actually pretty reasonable overall and compared to the company's history. Now, it is 33 PE ratio with a pretty anemic top line growth, so keep that in mind. If we look at the forward PE ratio, it's about 29, which is even better. Not as good as when it was in almost 15 last summer, but it's under 30 right now. What about price to free cash flow? Well, the numbers haven't had a chance to get digested by Y charts. We see that this has been all over the map because the way that Netflix has to spend money in order to make its movies beforehand, um, it makes free cash flow a little bit wonky. After today's numbers get digested, it should show that Netflix's price to free cash flow is about 51. So that's also not bad. But what if we look at a reverse discounted cash flow model? Well. We've made one of these right here, and you see all we have to do is type in the ticker symbol, Netflix, right here. Um, I did the math, and they've got 2934 about million um, dollars in free cash flow over the trailing 12 months. We have to pick a terminal growth rate, and three seems about reasonable after 10 years. Discount rate of about 10 means medium level of, of risk. And so we, what I have to do now is make these two numbers match. 
about $333 to say, how fast does Netflix's free cash flow have to grow over the next 10 years to for, for today's price to make sense? 10%? No, it needs to grow faster than that because these two need to match. How about 15%? Well, we're getting a little bit closer now. What about 20%? Does it need to grow 20%? Hey, we're getting closer here. So maybe like 19.5%? That's pretty close about 19 and a half percent. So let's break down what this means. Today's price assumes, given the discount rate that I put in of 10%, given the terminal growth rate of 3%, it assumes that Netflix needs to grow at about 19 and a half percent in order for it to for it to justify today's price. Does that make sense? Well, let's get back to that free cash flow number. The reason that free cash flow was so high was that they cut down on spending for new shows. If they can do that and still add members over the next 10 years, well then yeah, they could do that. But if the fact that though there, there's gonna be fewer shows a year, two years, three years from now than there was before because they cut a billion dollars in spending and that stops people from joining the service, well, then that could be a problem. That is the key question that investors need to figure out for themselves. Again, thanks to YCharts for sponsoring today's video. If you want to give YCharts a try for free, see the link in the show notes below. If you're interested in getting a free copy of that discounted cash flow model that I showed you, that is in the show notes as well. As far as this one's concerned, we'll check back in 90 days to see what's happening. That's all for now. Brian, out.